This early look at the upcoming second half of the Battlefield 1 Turning Tides DLC made possible by a capture event sponsored by EA and DICE. Hey folks, Dave here, diving back into some Battlefield 1. Today, I'm going to be taking an early look at some content coming out next month as the second half of the release of the Battlefield 1 Turning Tides DLC. The first half, which came out December 11th, I already talked about in a previous video, that first half brought Battlefield 1's content to the shores of Gallipoli with the British and Anzac invasion of Cape Hells. Along with Cape Hells, the first half of the content also included the map Achi Baba and an overall operation that combined the two in that naval invasion there in Gallipoli. In the second half of the DLC launch in January, we're going to see the Great War move from Gallipoli to the North Sea. Two naval operation maps will be included in that second launch, Zeebrugge as well as Heligoland Bight, which involved the British Royal Marines we're going to see a uh, greater focus on the naval combat, with both the German Navy and the British having naval forces of their own to pit against each other in open sea combat. In a capture event just yesterday, I got to get my hands on the Heligoland Bight early dev version of the map. So what you're going to see here are just white box textures in a grid pattern, almost like an unfinished Counter-Strike map. This is what you would generally see as artists are working on refining what the map is going to play like before they spend a bunch of time adding in all the micro detailing and the texturing and the effects and stuff like that. So what you're seeing here is basically just the raw gameplay. Again, in this earlier version of the map, the devs are mostly looking for feedback on things like flag placement, overall balancing, if the attacking team has too much of a disadvantage, and things like that. The Battle of Heligoland Bight is interesting in World War I history because it was actually one of the first naval battles of the First World War. Heligoland, being situated quite far off the coast, the northwest coast of Germany, was a tempting target for the British Navy. The British, of course, being known for their naval strength. Besides being the first naval battle, this was also an absolute knockdown drag out fight with a ton of ships committed to the fight. The German Navy lost three light cruisers as well as a destroyer as well as getting a number of additional light cruisers heavily damaged and losing almost a thousand sailors. The actual fight was quite lopsided though, as the British lost less than a hundred men and a handful of ships, and it was regarded as a fantastic victory back home for the British. The effects of this engagement and the real-world German loss were pretty apparent in the actual war. The German Navy was recalled to port, and for quite a few months, it really didn't do a whole lot at all. Here in Battlefield 1, you can expect an intense representation of this battle, with both sides getting naval forces compared to the previous maps we've seen from the Turning Tides DLC. Both the Germans and the Royal British Marines do get their own L-Class destroyer spawns. If one side gets too far behind in points, there can be a Dreadnought that reinforces for some serious naval firepower. There are a massive amount of landing ships as well as torpedo boats, and of course, a number of planes to help make things up in the air as well. The version of this map that I played was Conquest Assault, which works just like traditional Conquest as far as flag capturing goes, except for one side starts out with all of the flags and a point deficit, and the attacking side gets none of the flags but a slight point advantage. You've got to essentially beat the clock if you're the attacking team, You've got to get a foothold there on the beach, get a number of flags captured, get that majority, and prevent the point burn from taking advantage of your team's lack of flags. You don't want to get too far behind, you've got to make that initial attack count in Conquest Assault. So let's talk about how this map played out in Conquest Assault. You've got five flags in the current setup. You've got flag A being the lighthouse on the eastern side of the map, which is closest to the invading British forces. 
and you have the B flag, which has a huge trench network all around it. It's kind of the primary beach site, if you will. As a part of that, it also has a coastal defense cannon. Then you've got C, which is a fascinating flag, a lot of fun to fight over as infantry, but quite exposed because it's on a destroyed dreadnought. It's kind of beached there on the rocks, there's some fires burning, but you can climb all over it and get to multiple parts of the upper decks, and a whole bunch of the whole front side of the ship is the capture zone. Again, the downside, if you're capturing it there on the ship itself, is that all these gunboats and the larger L-class destroyers and perhaps the dreadnoughts are swarming all around this beach dreadnought. And if you're on foot, you're going to want to hide in the shadows of the superstructure of this ship as you're capturing it there at sea because you are a sitting duck out there. D-Flag, which is the southernmost flag on the map, is a simple defensive network with just a little bunker there for watching the most western and southern parts of the map. Flags A, B, C, and D make a wide U-shape, and they're actually somewhat close together, and it makes a pretty easy kind of uh, leapfrog pattern, uh, I guess maybe a stair-stepping pattern would be a better way to put it, from A to D for the British if they get a capture roll going. One cool effect of the C flag, though, is it does block quite a few of the sight lines from B to D, perhaps allowing the Germans a chance to regroup there at D and counterattack. Or they could possibly counterattack from E flag, which is completely off way by itself on the northernmost part of the map where a submarine has beached on the rocks. I believe that's one of the German submarines. I don't know for sure though, because the only times that I saw this flag were when I was going over in a plane. I never actually made the trek around the northeast part of the map to go take a look because it was just so far away and I was trying to try out as many of the ships and boats as possible and then I got wrapped up in the fight itself, fighting over, again, flags A, B, C, and D in that nice curve shape and I almost completely forgot that E flag was even there. Hopefully before the release of the full map, we'll see some additional routes being given to uh, players as a way to get over to E, perhaps. I heard some cave systems thrown forward just from some of the players. I don't know if that's possible at this stage in the map development, but that was just one of the ideas. Perhaps a few extra boats lined up, pointed in that direction would be helpful. Or maybe just some paths to get directly over those large cliff faces, because right now you've got to trek all the way around to get to E. You can't just go over. So if you're going to go from B to E, for example, you've got a huge... Uh, walk first east and then northwest to get up there to it. On the other hand, perhaps with more experience, this wouldn't be an issue as there already are a ton of boat spawns on the map as a whole, and players might figure out that, hey, there's almost no one there at E-Flag. That's a freebie for my team. If I'm the first one there with a boat, I can just lock it down and keep it for myself. Bring a book, though. You might get bored. It gets pretty quiet over there from what I've seen. Don't let the kind of clustered look of the flags on the mini-map confuse you though, or deceive you I guess. This is actually a huge, huge map. Even just between B and A, as you're running at what looks like a pretty straight shot uh, between those two flags, the beach section there is probably a couple of hundred meters wide and all the rock outcroppings that are your cover there are surprisingly huge. It's probably a good thing that we can't access the entire part of the upper part of the map there along the upper cliff sides because you would end up getting completely lost or you'd be one of those players down on the beach that's constantly being shot in the back by players in the middle of nowhere. For the most part though, even for a map this huge, the action is very very focused and very very intense. I had a blast playing both in planes, in ships, as well as just the torpedo boats, and even cruising along in some landing craft to make those amphibious invasions, smashing to shore with all those machine guns blazing away. In fact, I think my only balance notes for this early version of the map might be just one less plane per side, because if one team does get all three planes in the sky uh, for their side at the same time, perhaps a couple of attack planes and a bomber to work on the ships, it can get really nasty for the team that doesn't have any pilots on their side. I don't think three planes are necessary, I think two per side is enough. I imagine DICE's idea behind the three planes was to give a side more options for attacking the boats, but from what I saw, once a side got air superiority, they weren't attacking the boats anymore, they were just harvesting infantry. Even as a pilot, I'll agree, 
That's not a lot of fun for everybody else, perhaps just those two planes per side. Alright guys, that's my first impressions taking a look at this new map. I am loving the theme here in Turning Tides, and I am beyond excited as you guys saw in my last Battlefield video. At the return of full naval combat to the Battlefield series, I'd love to see more of this in the future, perhaps some submarines and some larger ships, and just some all-out naval warfare, but I gotta say, having destroyers for each side does scratch that itch pretty well. Hope you guys enjoyed, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.